For many of us, getting a drink of water is as simple as turning on the faucet. But here in northern Kenya, getting water is a lot more work. For most of the year, rain is nothing more than a distant memory. In the dry months, stream beds dry up and finding water becomes a challenge. Digging under the sand like this is the only way to get a simple drink around here. Julius is a global mission pioneer working in this part of Kenya. He came here to share the gospel message with this remote group. Through Christ's method, Julius has developed real relationships with the villagers, and many of them have accepted Jesus into their hearts. Sadly, these new believers don't have a church building of their own to worship in. They meet regularly inside this humble, mud-walled building. This space is a public facility owned by the area chief, and he allows them to gather here. The villagers hope to have an Adventist church building someday. They trust that God will provide for them and are grateful for the temporary space they worship in now. This has been the location of countless Bible studies, prayer meetings, and singing sessions. Julius loves discussing new topics with the villagers, and they are eager to learn more. Joseph and Penina are married, and they've been studying the Bible with Julius for quite some time now. They have committed their lives to Jesus, but haven't had the opportunity to be baptized yet. Joseph and Penina have been waiting about a year for enough rain to come to this area so they can get baptized. It is so dry that it isn't possible without a good rain. Until then, they wait patiently and continue studying and learning with Julius. Despite the challenges, God is doing amazing things in villages like this through the work of Global Mission Pioneers. Julius and other pioneers in Kenya ask for your prayers. Advancing the work can be difficult here, but God's faithful servants are eager to share his message. Please pray for pioneers around the globe and consider how you can support them. Thank you for supporting Mission. Happy Sabbath and welcome to the Community Praise Church located in Alexandria, Virginia. My name is Braun Jacobs, senior pastor of this wonderful congregation. And whether you are joining us online or worshiping right here in the sanctuary, we pray that you would be richly blessed by today's worship experience. So welcome to CPC. Let us exalt his name together. You can say amen one more time. Let's put our hands together and bless God for our young people. Thank you. Have mercy. What a joy it is to see young people in worship, praising the name of Jesus. Isn't that right? To God be the glory. I also want to take this opportunity just to thank God for our two young ladies that are actually doing the prayer this morning. That was uh, Miss Rachel Johns, who led us in prayer. Amen. Yes, and Miss Aristova leading us in our uh, scripture today, and it's just good just to see God using our young people. I'm so excited today that we're beginning launching out into a new sermon series that will take us into the month of March. Grace, that works. Can you see that on the screen? If you would place that just that, that flyer on the screen for those of you perhaps are visiting here with us today or if you are here for perhaps the first time, Grace That Works. For the next few weeks, we're going to be marching through the epistle to the Romans. I actually call it the gospel of Romans because here Paul shares with us what it means to have peace in our salvation. And so we're blessing God for that. We're asking that you would come each and every week and ensure that you are blessed, that you are blessed. This morning, we are lifting from Romans, the third chapter and the 25th verse. If you would place that on the screen. So don't, don't worry about that word. I, I practice it about 10 times. Not sure if I'm going to get it right. <laughs> but this is the signature 
signature verse, if you will, from Romans, the third chapter. For the Bible says that God presented him, that is Jesus, as a propitiation through faith in his blood. That word propitiation literally means an offering that appeases God's wrath. And the Bible says that God offered Jesus, have mercy, to appease the wrath. You ought to say amen about that today. This is the crux of the gospel. And just for a few moments, place our title screen. I want to place a tag on this text this morning and begin this, this series, Grace That Works, under the subject, Jesus took one for the team. Jesus took one for the team. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, we are, we are in need. I am in need of you this morning. And I pray today, God, that you would hover over this place and teach us the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Show us, Father, what the sacrifice of Jesus truly meant. And further reveal to us, O oh God, how we might have peace and joy as we learn to grow in Christ. For this is our prayer as we petition the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit. And we ask it now in Jesus' name. Let those who believe say amen. 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 Jesus took one for the team. A few months ago, I was talking to a dear friend of mine who shared a story that radically reshaped how I view the gospel of Jesus Christ. He began to share that there was a time in his prodigal son phase where he and one of his buddies decided to engage in some criminal mischief, mischief that would perhaps, if they were caught, land them in the county jail but not in prison. And so they decided together one day after their college classes to engage in this mischief with the certainty that the campus police would not find out. But how many folks know that sin has a funny way of finding you out all the time? And so before they knew it, like, like a SWAT team out of a movie, they found themselves underneath the barrels of the guns of campus security. And before he knew it, this church boy who grew up in the church, this church boy who grew up in Pathfinders, this church boy who understood what it meant to live for God, found himself face down on a cop car. He and his other friend, the other friend uh, was nowhere near the church. And in fact, as they found themselves together, a precarious dilemma began to unfold. And what my friend shared with me that happened next radically reshaped my view of the gospel. For he shared with me at that time, though they both were guilty, though they both were, uh, were guilty of committing the crime, and while they both were on the scene of the crime, this friend who was nowhere near the church looked at the cops, looked at my friend, and shared this story with the cops. He said, sir, I just want to let you know that my friend here had nothing to do with this crime. He said, I want you to please, sir, let him go because I assume full responsibility. Now, that was not the truth, but if there ever was a time where you appreciate someone lying, <laughs> that would be the time. Are you hearing me today? For the fact was, listen, they both were guilty. They both committed the crime. They both should have been doing time. But he looked at the officer and said, let him off. And as my friend later went back to him and said, man, please help me understand why did you do that for me? He looked at my friend and said, man, you're a church boy. He says, I understand that you have great potential. I know how to navigate the criminal justice system. So I'll take this charge. I can get off just to make sure that you know I love you. I'll take this one for the team. Now, folk, let me tell you something today. I don't know about you, but it's one thing for a guilty man to take a charge for another guilty man. It's a completely different level of love when an innocent man takes a charge for a guilty man. 
And if you can understand that truth, then you can understand a window into the gospel of Jesus Christ. For beloved, I want to share with you today that when Jesus died on Calvary, he should have, watch this, the reason he was on Calvary in the first place is because I've been charged with the crime of sinning against my God. Jesus could have hung me out to dry. He could have left me there by myself. But is there anybody in the building today who's grateful that Jesus died on Calvary bearing the load of my sin? He took one for the team so that Braun Jacobs could stay on the team. Jesus took the charge for us. Now, let's be honest, folks. That doesn't happen often. I'll be honest with you. I had some cousins in my family. I thought we were close. Until stuff started happening around grandma's house. Are oh, you hearing me today? You see, we had, a, we had a rule in our house that if something went down and we all were present, that nobody talked. In fact, we implemented this rule, snitches get stitches. <laughs> Y'all hear me today? But what we forgot is that grandma also had a rule, and that rule was if something happened, everybody's present, nobody tells, everybody gets a spanking. Matter of fact, sometimes she upgraded that thing. She said, everybody gets a beating. How many folks know there's a difference between a spanking? <laughs> Y'all hear me today? When grandma unleashed that belt like Zorro, <laughs> folks start, come on now, folks start confessing sins on the spot. They started telling you where it happened, who you did it with, what kind of attitude you had when it went down. Um, they were, watch this, they were not going to take one for the team. Hey, but this is why I'm grateful for Jesus. <laughs> because the Bible lets us know, watch this, that while Jesus could have left me wallowing in my sins, hallelujah, while Jesus could have allowed me to be buried by my transgressions, Jesus said, I'm not going to let my boy hang out there like that. I'm going to take one for the team so Braun can experience grace. That's the essence of the gospel. It's an innocent man, come on church, putting up with the foolishness of guilty people. And if you're honest this week, you know that you did some things this week that should have landed you on the cross. Ah, but is there anybody in the building today who's just grateful for God of a second chance? Oh, come on. Anybody grateful for God of a third chance? Uh, and the God of a fourth chance? And the God of a fifth chance? God who gives oxygen, hallelujah, to people who don't deserve it. I'm grateful today that Jesus took one for the team. I, I believe today, I believe today that this is what Paul is trying to unveil in Romans chapters 1 through 3. Hear me today. The Bible reminds us that Paul is writing to a church that he's never met. And this is the opportunity for Paul to unveil the power of the gospel to those who have heard of his ministry. But before Paul deals with the gospel, he must first make a point in Romans 1 and 2 that sin, hear me church, has devastated the human race. And folk, let me tell you something. All we, we, don't need Paul to, 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 we don't need Paul to tell us that sin has devastated the human race. All you have to do is turn on the news, Amen. And you can tell, folks, we, we are in a mess right now. When a 12-year-old girl can take a gun to school, open up fire on classmates. How many folks know that sin has taken its toll on society? When you have a despotic ruler who can unleash chemical weapons on children and cause them to suffer, suffer a horrendous death, sin has taken its toll on society. And Paul reminds us today... In Romans 1.18, that God, hallelujah, is going to deal with the sin problem. Now, folks, let me tell you something. You all may think that God is meek. But let me tell you, don't, don't, don't mistake his meekness for weakness. Y'all hear me today. You see, there are some things that God allows to slide, not because he's weak. He lets it slide because he has some folk who've been coming to church week in, week out, hearing all this preaching, all this singing, and you still have not been converted. God says, I'm going to allow you to be saved. I'm not going to hold my peace much longer. And I say, even so, come soon, Lord Jesus. So the Bible tells us in Romans 1.18, listen, put this on the screen. The Bible says the wrath of God is being what, everybody? Is being what? 
from where? Against all the what? And the what? Wickedness of people. The Bible tells us that God is going to unleash his wrath. Because he is sick and tired of sin. Now, folks, let me tell you something. Uh, there are some individuals who are challenged of the notion of a loving God also being a wrathful God. It's difficult for some people to really place this in one sentence. But let me suggest to us today that the wrath of God and the love of God are two sides of the same coin. Are you hearing me today? God's wrath is actually an indication of his love. I like how Marvin Moore puts it in, in his book, uh, Forever He Is. Marvin Moore describes a scenario that helps us to understand how wrath can actually be love. He, he paints a scenario of a mother who is in her house and she discovers that there's a criminal outside who is waiting, watch this, to hurt, yea, molest her daughter. And then Marvin Moore paints this picture. He says, which scenario demonstrates more love? A mother who goes into the back room and says, Lord, please, I pray in the name of Jesus that this criminal would not touch my daughter. Or this mother, like my grandmother, who would go in the back room, grab her 12-gauge shotgun, line the criminal up between the crosshairs, and say, if you put one fingernail on her, I will introduce you to my twin cousins, Smith and Wesson. You understand? Listen to me. I would suggest to you today that this mother demonstrated her love for her daughter by indicating wrath on anything that would hurt her. And I want to suggest to us today that God's wrath being poured out against sin is God's wrath being poured out against anything that hurts us. And beloved, let me tell you something. Every time God sees his children shed a tear, it makes him shed a tear. He is sick and tired of sin uh, having a devastating effect on the church and on the world. But here's the problem. The problem is that when God comes to unleash his wrath against sin, if there is no buffer between us and sin, then not only will he consume sin, he's going to consume us. Because let's be honest, just this week, every single person in this church has done something worthy of the wrath of God. Are you hearing me today? And if you believe that you've done nothing, let me introduce you to your first sin, self-righteousness. You're hearing me today. Everybody has done something that is worthy of the wrath of God. And the question that I'm asking today is this. Who can free me from the power of God's wrath when I know that I've done something that should, that should in fact receive the wrath of God? Beloved, this is why I believe Paul writes Romans the third chapter and the 25th verse. You put this on the screen. Listen to what Paul says. Paul says that God presented him, that is Jesus, as a propitiation through faith in his blood. Watch this. Propitiation literally means a gift that appeases wrath. So the Bible says, I'm going to judge sin, Braun, but because I love CPC so much, I'm not going to allow CPC to receive the wages and the wrath of sin. I'm going to allow Jesus to absorb the wrath so that Braun can receive my grace. Uh, he, says, he says, I'm going to allow Jesus to absorb the anger so Braun can receive mercy. I'm going to let Jesus, hallelujah, take one for the team so Braun can stay on the team. Now, beloved, let me tell you something. I don't know about you, but I'm grateful today that I have a God who's willing to step in and take punishment that I could not handle by myself. Thank you, Jesus. Because the fact is, folks, if all of us had to deal with the weight and the punishment of sin, there would be nothing left for us for God to deal with. But God says, in order to have something to convert... <laughs> He says, I'm going to bear the weight myself so you can hang around long enough to be changed in my image. Man, that's good news. That's good news. Folk, I mean, it, it doesn't even register in our mind. I, I, have, I have a sister, and listen, there is not one day where I vow to take a spanking for Jasmine. <laughs> Come on now. I love my sister to death, huh? But I don't love her in, uh, uh, enough to take a spanking for her. Are you hearing me today? Huh? I love my relatives. But I don't, love them enough, uh, I don't love them enough to go to jail for them. Man, but, she, but look, listen, look at the gospel. Jesus said, I will, I, will, I will bear 
God turning his back on me so that you can know that he will never turn his back on you. He said, I will, I will deal with the fact that God has, has rejected me, hallelujah, so that God will never reject you. This ought to change how you view yourself when you make a mistake. I'm so tired of folks coming in church saying, oh, pastor, this is a bad week. Listen, you won't have a bad week till Jesus comes. Come on now. You always going to have a bad week. So this was a bad week. Last week was a bad week. You just didn't know it because you've been blinded by self-righteousness. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short. That is, that means that even when you make it, you still don't make it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He says you fall short. That means that your best is not good enough. God says, thank you, Jesus, that he makes up the difference. Come on, give Jesus an amen in this place. Oh, my goodness. I understand everybody can say amen to that because you know, some folks, you know, you just picture perfect. You've never done anything to hurt God or to embarrass God. You never smoked anything. You had no business smoking. You never drank anything, had no business drinking. Oh, you just a good old Adventist, happy Sabbath, granola eating, happy Sabbath saying, never done anything. you never been to a place you should not have been, never been to a place you never been with somebody you should not have been with. So watch this. This sermon is not for you. Just come back next week. But how about this? For the remaining 100% of us <laughs> who know that if it had not been for the mercy and for the grace of Jesus that we would be lost, you ought to give God some praise. So here it is. Three, three, there, there's some three quick points. I'm done. What are the benefits we receive from this sacrifice? I want to suggest to us today, the first benefit is that we receive a life, hear me church, free from condemnation. The Bible makes it clear that God did not come into the world to condemn the world. Come on now. But that the world through him might be saved. The problem is, now I'm trying to keep to the notes. This thing is good. The problem is that some of us don't know the difference between conviction and condemnation. You see, conviction brings you to church. But condemnation keeps you away from church. Conviction puts you on your knees. Condemnation keeps you off your knees. Conviction helps you see how much you need Jesus. Condemnation gives you a false view of Jesus. Some of us have broken the commandments, hear me, because we have a, fa we have a false God in our minds, a God that we feel is against us when God has done everything possible to be for us. He says, con listen, here's, here's what I'm trying to say. Condemnation is not an emotion that God's children should experience. Conviction, yes. Condemnation, no. How do you know? It's right in the text. The Bible makes it, makes it clear. As a matter of fact, one of the things that I've learned is that we kind of we set this thing up with how we engage one with another. I realized the other day that I was actually perpetuating this idea even in my home. Even now, it's, it's good parenting, but it's bad gospel. Let me help you out. <laughs> Y'all hear me? Good parenting, bad gospel. So, so uh, my daughter and I, we've been having this tussle, man, over this iPad. Come, do, I have, do I have a witness in the house today? I'm talking about this gadget generation, all right? It's like, girl, listen, I bought this. She didn't pay a dime for it. One year old knows, knows how to, uh, you know, my, my one-year-old daughter knows how to work. The so, there's something scary about that. Something scary about that. So, so, so watch this. We're having this tussle with the iPad. And so, and so finally I said, watch this. I said, Alana, if you want to gain the iPad, you have to lose the attitude. <laughs> Wait a minute. Now, now, now come on. Let's, now let's pause here. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. That's good parenting. <laughs> Don't take this illustration too far. Are you hearing me now? There's a limit to that thing. I believe that a little legalism works every now and then to keep some order in your house. But watch this. It is not an accurate representation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when we adopt that mentality, we, we, we position ourselves to feel the con condemnation from God. Because the Bible is clear that God does not, God doesn't, listen, let me tell you something. God has given us some of our best blessings and our worst spiritual moments. Come on and say amen. 
You know there are times when God has given you favor on the heels of your failure. He has given you mercy on the heels of your mess. He has given you a second chance on the heels of your sin because he wants to let us know that, watch this, I'm not blessing you because of your performance. I'm blessing you because of your faith. And if we get that thing through our minds, it changes how we view our walk with God. I want to suggest to us today that Paul is unveiling this in Romans 3.24. Watch this. Look at what the Bible says. For they are justified by his what, everybody? Oh, come on, say it. By his what? As a what? Woo, come on now. Not a paycheck, a gift through the redemption which is in Jesus Christ. Man, this, this thing is so amazing to me. The Bible says that, now first you must understand what justification means. I tried to find a way to share this, and the best way I can share what justification means is to take you to Luke, the 15th chapter, and to allow you to see this prodigal son who has allowed himself to believe the lie that the grass is greener on the other side. Now, you must allow me to see him through the lens of 21st century eyes, for I see this young man who is so big and bad, he takes his daddy's money, goes to Dulles Airport, charters a one-way ticket to Vegas. Uh, 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 He spends his daddy's money at the blackjack table. He spends his daddy's money on loose living and, and, and wild more. He spends his daddy's money. But listen, by the time he's done, the boy has to take a Greyhound back to D.C. Come on and say amen. <clears throat> Can you see him? Can you see him? His clothes are tattered. Adventist church boy spelling like pigsty and here it is and, 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 and he adopts this mentality that many of us adopt when we feel when we know that we've messed up and we're trying to get back in good graces with God listen to what he says in Luke 15 18 I will set out and go back to my father and say to him father I've sinned against heaven and against you in other words he's preparing his speech of how, what he's going to do for his father in order to get back in good graces Hey, but watch the daddy. The Bible tells us that the father would have no such thing. For when the boy comes back home, the father sees the boy. Listen, with tendencies that he's picked up in the far country. Are you hearing me now? With habits that he's picked up in the far country. He left, he left drinking postum. Now he's drinking cognac. Come on now. He has proclivities. He's picked up in the far country. And the boy's wondering, what will my daddy do with this sullied character of mine? Hey, look at the gospel. The Bible says in Luke 15, 22, but the father said to his servants, bring out the best. What, everybody? Oh, and do what? <laughs> he did not ask the boy to clean up first. He said, put the robe on him. Bring him in. I'll clean him up after he gets in. Lord, help him. Help him get it. Now, now, beloved, I want you to hear me today. I want you to hear me today. The father puts the robe on top of a solid character. He puts the robe on top of a temper that still needs to be subdued. He puts the robe on top of lustful habits and tendencies. He puts the robe back on someone who knows they should be paying tithe, ain't paid it in 10 years. He puts the robe on them, watch this, because he wants his son to know, I don't want you to clean up, then I accept you. I will accept you, now come clean up. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ, beloved. I want to suggest to us today that this thing, man, ought to change, radically change your Christian life. It ought to help you understand, man, that when you come to God, that God accepts you just as you are. And changes you into what he wants you to be. Listen, Ellen White has gotten a bad rap. Give me a little bit. Give me a little bit more on the monitor. Ellen White has gotten a bad rap here because we have painted our dear sister in a way in which it would cause some to believe that she did not understand the beauty of justification by faith. But not only did she did she understand it, it formed the very backbone of her ministry. Listen to what she says here, Sons and Daughters, page one fifty five. I want to introduce some of you to a new Ellen White today. She says, to go forward without what, everybody? That is, to live a life of victory, we must have the what? That a hand or what? 
will hold us up and an infinite pity be exercised towards us if we fall. Watch this. She says, if you want to live a victorious life, it does not come by gritting your teeth. It does not come by willpower. She says it comes by having the assurance that you serve a God who will take you as you are and transform you into what he wants you to be. And will not kick you off the team every time you stumble. I understand. But she also understood there'll be some people who would come behind her and say, well, she said, if we fall, not when we fall. So watch this. The sister doubled herself up. Then she said in Selected Messages, Volume 1, 337, she says, we shall, what everybody? In our what? To copy the divine pattern. In other words, she's not making an excuse for our sin, but she's, she is telling us, thank you, brother, she's telling us that as you learn to come to Jesus, it is a process, not a moment. Are y'all hearing me today? And because it takes a while, God says, I'm going to take one for the team to endure the wrath of your sins so that you can stay on the team while you learn the rules of the team. He goes on. Fourth volume of the testimonies, 612. Wrong habits are not overcome by what, everybody? Only through long and what? Is self-mastered. Bible is clear that God, hallelujah. Now listen, if you get nothing else from the sermon today, get this. God does not ask us to clean up before he grants blessings. He grants blessings to generate generosity to clean us up. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm glad about it. Let me share you an illustration. Um, when, I was, when I was a teenager, I was actually given a job in Hawthorne, Florida to clean the bathrooms at camp meeting. Now, anybody who knows Hawthorne, Florida and anybody who knows camp meeting knows that's a grungy job. I will spare you the details. Let's just say that that encouraged me to, to go to school. Are y'all hearing me today? I, and so watch this, at, at, the conclusion, at the conclusion of the day, I would always come home. But when I came back to the cabin, my mother met me at the door like a five-star general. She said, you will not come in this cabin until you clean up. Oh, listen, good parenting, bad gospel. <laughs> huh? Because watch this, and I understood it. As a matter of fact, if I had a son who is as sullied as I was, he'd have to clean up too. But I'm just grateful that God doesn't treat us the same way. Hey, because when we come sullied and stained, God says, come on in, then I'll clean you up. This is why, listen, this is why I've learned that when people come to the church with issues and with challenges and with problems and with addictions, we ought to keep our mouths closed. Don't say nothing about, let them come and worship because you just don't know God has brought somebody in to clean them up. So, so here it is. Paul also suggests that we receive these benefits when we demonstrate biblical faith in Jesus. Here it is. It's right here, Romans 3, verse 26. Put that on the screen, if you will. The Bible says, he did it to do what, everybody? To do what? To demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those, read this last phrase, who have what? Ah, uh, there it is. There it is. Paul says this thing is profoundly simple. He says if you want to receive the blessings of Jesus taking one for the team, then you must learn, hallelujah, the power of having true biblical faith in Jesus. It's just that simple. Now, let me also say that please don't leave here because I know you have some scholars amongst us. There's those of you who are deep in the word or you, 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 you feel that you know a little bit of Bible. Let me help you today. Listen to me. Listen to me today. I don't want you to leave here thinking that Paul is telling us that we can lace our sin, hear me today, with the name of Jesus and feel that that faith allows us to be justified. Are y'all hearing me today? That's not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that if you have a, listen to me, a true biblical faith, then that biblical faith allows you the blessing of being justified by Jesus while you're being cleansed by Jesus. Are you hearing me today? You see, real biblical faith repents of our sins. It puts ourselves on the side of obedience and makes a decision to overcome no matter how painful that struggle may be. And God says you have that kind of faith. 
He said, I will never turn my back on you. I'll never turn my back on you. I think puzzled me for a while because I often heard people who would, who would say, you know, there's no way that God can have that type of, of leniency. There's, it's cheap grace. But you must understand the power of loyalty. You see, when God sees some, someone who's loyal, it makes a difference on who stays on his team or not. Let me, let me, let me help you out. Uh, some of you saw this about, maybe about two or three weeks ago. Um, the Minnesota Vikings play the New Orleans Saints. Y'all see that? Y'all saw that game? <laughs> yeah. The Saints fans like, no, nah, we, we, we didn't see that game. <laughs> Rough game. But down to the end, the game was tight. You hear me today? I mean, it was 24-23. The Saints are up one on the verge of the NFC Championship game. But you know the story. Casey Keenan on the 40-yard line, he steps back, throws a Hail Mary to Diggs. Diggs jumps up. Marcus, I don't know what that boy was doing. I have no idea what was going through his end. Marcus Williams, I mean, I mean completely underbombs the tackle. Diggs comes down, runs 40 yards to the end zone. Uh, uh, the stadium goes bananas. Vikings win. Saints go home. Now, now watch this. I watched him at the podium as he made his interview. And I could tell, watch this, that he was, I'm, I'm trying to help you understand why God keeps us on the team even though we make mistakes. I, I was trying to, you could see that he was contrite. You could see that this young man was crushed at his core. And the amazing thing that happened is that as a result of how he handled himself, he literally gained the respect of his teammates, the management, and the city. When he got back to New Orleans, they had a banner on the city saying, we love Marcus Williams. He made a mistake, but they still love him. <laughs> the teammate said, yes, he made a mistake, but he's still my teammate. We st that's still my boy. The management said, he made a mistake, but we're not going to cut him. Why? Because he's demonstrated loyalty all year long. This was just a moment. It was not the trend of his athletic career. You see, that's why God is able to stick with us even though we make mistakes. Because God says, that was just a moment, but it's not the trend of his life. But this boy has his, his heart and his head aimed towards glory. And God says, when you have that type of faith, I'll cover you till I cleanse you. I'll cover you till I cleanse you. Man, folks, that's good gospel. I wish, I wish that I could get this through the heads of some of our discouraged brothers and sisters who come to church week in, week out, disappointed by your performance. Don't you know that God, listen, it's, it's his job. It's his job to perform in us. It's our job to stay connected to him. And if we learn the power of abiding in Jesus, oh, what a transformed people we would be. But I believe there's, there's one last point I want to share with you today. For the Bible not only reveals how we receive that faith. Listen, it reveals what we, sh what we should do with the reality of Jesus taking one for the team. I believe with that reality, the Bible is clear that we should live to uphold the true purpose of the law. Here's what the Bible says, Romans 3 and verse 31. Would you read this with me? Read the entire passage. Bible says, do we then make what? Through faith. He says, certainly what? Certainly not. On the what? We do what? Ah, he says, yeah, all this, because you, know, you see, Paul wrote this because he knew that he, he would have some folk accusing him of cheap grace. So Paul says, let me make it clear that grace does not make void the law. Grace simply establishes the law. And the reason it establishes the law, hear me today, listen to this statement, is because once by grace we recognize that the law is not on top of us, it allows God to put the law inside of us. You see, the problem, the reason God can put the law inside of us is because we believe the law is on top of us. We believe it is a burden to carry. But man, God says, once you understand justification by faith, I will etch my law in your heart so that you do by default what you were straining to do before by effort. Amen. It becomes your second nature, hallelujah, to give your life for Jesus Christ. Beloved, let me tell you something. I'm grateful today. That Jesus Christ took one for the team. He took the wrath so I could receive his grace. Can you say amen about it today? 
And I'm grateful because not only did Jesus take one for the team, but Jesus endured the scorn for the team. Because I can see him even now. If you witness it, you, perhaps you can see him even now. Can you see Jesus on that Friday evening standing before the high court allowing mere mortals to slap him in the face, to scorn him, to mock him in open shame? There are some who would say, look at Jesus preparing for the crucifixion. But I say, look at Jesus taking one for the team. Can you see Jesus today? As he is allowing himself to, be, to stand before Pilate as a sheep before the shearers. He has nothing to say. He watches Pilate who had an opportunity to take Jesus off the hook, say nothing and wash his hands of my Savior's innocent blood. There are some who would say, look at Jesus preparing for the crucifixion. Ah, uh, but I say, look at Jesus taking one for the team. Can you see them this morning as they strip Jesus down naked, have mercy. As they beat him with a cat of nine tails and as they, they mock him, as they place a purple robe on his back and a crown of thorns on his head. Jesus had the opportunity to leave the crucifixion scene right there and he could have left us in our sin, hallelujah, but Jesus said, no, I got to take one for the team so Braun can stay on the team. Can you see Jesus today? As he walks down Via Della Rosa, the weight, watch this, not of the cross, but the weight of separation from his father is now crushing him to the ground. And Jesus had the opportunity to say, Father, it's enough. But no, Jesus said, I'll take one for the team so CPC can stay on the team. Can you see him now as they place nails in his hands and nails in his feet? And they thrust my Jesus into the ground and hang him on a cross that should be reserved for a common criminal. And Jesus stood there naked, battered, bruised, and bleeding because he knew that in order for Braun Jacobs to be saved, he had to take one for the team. Folk, Jesus endured everything so that we could have everything. And today I'm glad about it. Jesus paid it all so that we could receive it all. Jesus endured it all so that we could have it all. And I don't know about you, but today I'm glad about it. I'm grateful for a God who willingly suffered an innocent man and endured the wrath and the scorn and the shame so that I might have a right to the tree of life. I want you to listen to the words of this song today because I believe that justification by faith is not just a principle. It is an action that God wants his people to put into motion in their lives. And so today after this song is sung, I'm coming back to share an appeal because God wants his people to know to dust yourself off. Hold your head high because Jesus Christ is not only able to receive the brunt of our sin, he is willing and God can do it. Listen to the words of this song before I appeal the song. That God might touch your hearts today in the house.
Since nothing could I have by thy grace to claim I'll wash my garment white In the blood of Calvary's lamb Father, speak to our hearts now. May the word of God make an impact today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My appeal to us is simple and threefold. I believe that this message ought to reshape how we view the ebb and flow of our lives. I'm convinced that the enemy understands if I can't, here, here is how, here's how the enemy works. If he can't get us through rebellion, he'll get us through discouragement. He calls us to become so discouraged with our Christian journey that we begin to forfeit the very power that Jesus paid for. Jesus, hallelujah, gave his life that we might have the covering of God's grace as we grow in God's grace. And so today God is simply calling for somebody to dust yourself off Get back in the game because the wrath that's being poured out is not being poured out on you. It's already been poured out on Jesus. God says, if you have faith in me, I'll cover you till you look like me. And so today God is calling for some soul just to get back into the game. For some soul perhaps who's watching online to come back to church and join the people of God in fellowship. For somebody to say that if Jesus be lifted up, he will draw all men unto himself. And so I believe today God is calling for somebody to get back into the game. But I believe there's a second appeal that God is calling for us to consider today. You see, when you truly understand the grace and the mercy of God in your life, you freely give that grace and mercy away to others. You show me a person that is unable to demonstrate grace, mercy, and forgiveness to someone else, I'll show you a person who has yet to experience the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. Because man, when God has done something for you, the natural response is to do something for somebody else. And so today God is saying, what I've given to you, I'm asking you now to give away to somebody else. And I don't know who it is. Maybe it's your son, your daughter. Maybe it's your husband or your wife. Maybe it's your co-worker. But God says... The grace that I've bestowed upon you, I'm asking you to give it to someone else. So who is that person today? Who, who is it that God is calling you to reveal the love of Jesus Christ to? Today is your opportunity to do that. And finally, I believe God is making clear that he wants his people to be open to the spirit of God writing his law upon our hearts. Folk, listen, I want to get to the place where my first response is God's first response. My first instinct is God's first instinct. And God said, I'll do it if you allow me to give you a new heart. Hallelujah. To take away your heart of stone and to give you a heart of flesh. And today, if that is your prayer, then this appeal is for you. And so today, we invite you, if you believe today that the Spirit of God is calling you to get back into the game, to, to, to understand and to know that your relationship to Jesus is not based on your performance, it's based on your faith. To understand that God is calling you to give away the grace that you so freely given. And to ask the Lord to write the spirit of his law upon your heart. If that's your decision today, would you stand with me in this building? We're going to ask that the Lord would do that for us today. That he would allow us to experience the blessings of Jesus taking one for the team. All over this place, the Spirit of God is moving on our hearts today. And before we end, we offer this final appeal to the people of God. There's someone here today in the balcony or on the floor. You know that 
the Lord is calling you to give your heart and your life to him today either through baptism or through rebaptism today you have felt the spirit of Jesus reminding you that he's calling his prodigal son prodigal daughter to come back home or maybe today you're not a prodigal maybe the Lord is calling you for the first time to give your heart and your life to him we offer invite you the opportunity to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior are you here today and if you are would you come down give us your hand give Jesus your heart you're praying now church if you would just pray for these few moments we're closing now pray for these few moments that some soul here today would allow the Spirit of God to move on their hearts you're here today we're not holding this appeal long but this moment is for you allow God's Spirit to move on your heart today are you here and even as we pray we invite you to slide out of your seat today and allow the Lord to seal your calling and election in this house of worship father now in the name of Jesus the appeal is open and the doors of heaven are open and today father our humble plea our prayer is that you'd allow us to experience the blessings of Jesus taking one for the team the reality Lord that the wrath of sin is not poured out upon us it's poured out upon Jesus so today father help us to get back into the game help some soul to recognize Lord that is not the performance that concerns you it is our faith help us to realize today that what we have been given from God we must give to others and father help us to realize today that what heaven looks for is the law of God written on our hearts and if you would do that father we'd be careful to give you the praise the honor and glory but we thank you today we ask these blessings now in the matchless name of Jesus Christ let those who believe in that name would you say amen come on say amen one more time and say amen thank God you may be seated now in the presence of Jesus this afternoon